The families have something to do with it. The lack of nurture, you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to educate inner city kids. They come into preschool age and, and kindergarten age missing so many of the nurturant features that we take for granted. The fact that, pe- that people read to them when they were little kids. That they already have did. A lot of them come in already able to read. I got two grandkids that could read before they went to school. You won't find any of that in the inner city. These people are mentally starved. They've been ignored and left on their own for huge tracts of time. Mom is preoccupied. She's busy trying to earn a living. She's gone. Dad, no one knows what happened to him. And it's a desperate situation. And so these kids have a difficult time learning. It takes a lot of extra nurture and care to educate inner city kids. So what shall we do? Basically, we're arguing that we should all band together and get a coordinated cross-cultural effort to serve the poor. We are going to have to leave our culture and enter into cultures that are different than ours. Whether in this country, you go into the inner city, it's a different culture than what we have up here on the university campus. And if you go to other lands, the difference is even going to be more extreme. And so we're called to get out of our comfort zone and to get into theirs. People will learn next week that go into world ministry, spend the first usually five years of solid work and suffering doing nothing, little really, besides learning the language and culture of the people they're going to serve for the next 15 years. We need to do service. We need to serve people in the context of long-term love relationships, the changing power of the love of God. That's what people need. And here is where governmental programs, I think, will never succeed. They can hand out cheese and buy them uh, housing. You know, America recently went through a big round of just blowing up all these urban renewal projects where the theory was if we get people to live in a nice condo-like building, you know, then they'll, they'll uh, you know, change their behavior. Typical superficial external answer to the problem that's so typical of the world, that's the perspective of the world, will just turn the knobs on the external and change the environment, and then because they feel that people are like programmed beings, that will change them, completely omitting the personal and spiritual dimensions of this. We can't do that. We have to be willing to go in and actually befriend these people, to love them with the love of Christ. And in that context to show them how they can escape poverty. That's going to cost. There comes the sacrifice now. This is the missing element in most church-related charities today in the U.S., is that nobody wants to go and make friends with the poor. We need to do better than that. Our service needs to come in the name of Christ and by His power. To think that this is just a humanistic endeavor is wrong and will fail. Christ changes lives. And we as Christians know that. We've had our own lives changed and we know that Jesus has the power to change lives. And not just temporarily either, but permanently from the inside out. And so when we bring help, not that we only help Christians that we help all poor people, but that we make it clear that we are Christians and that this is why we're doing what we're doing. And that we must build and maintain our base of operations, like what we're sitting in right here. It would be foolish just to say, let's throw down everything and just run off to serve the poor. We shouldn't waste another dollar on building the base of the fellowship here Well, that would be a real short-sighted and, frankly, ignorant position to take. You know, if we hadn't reached people here in the thousands in the fellowship, none of this ministry would be going on. It's essential that we continue that work at the same time that we reach out to the poor. Both things have to happen and they have to run together or else you're just 
uh, sawing off the limb that you're sitting on. I want to go over briefly what we've done so far, because this is this story isn't over. Okay, we're there are a lot of new ideas. There's going to be many different things happening in the future, but here's where we've come so far. We have set up a one of our six divisions in our church is called the missions division. And it largely deals with this issue of ministry to the poor. All of the people in our missions division work with the poor. There are 80.1 full-time equivalent staff. Half of those are indigenous. That is, in other countries, people that we have hired there to work with us in this project. So about 40 here in town full-time equivalent because there are really more people in that working for us, but some of them are part-time, so this is pooling them all together into the equivalent of full-timers. 16.3 of those equivalents are in domestic ministry, which we're going to discuss tonight. 61 of them are in world ministry, and we have three full-time equivalents working here at the church to oversee this whole thing. It's a pretty vast effort. We also experience significant costs in our infrastructure and operations. We have facilities and costs associated with just the ability to run these ministries cost money. And that's found, that part comes in from a different division. Also, the equipping budget is hit by the, our efforts to offer classes and training to poor people. This is the, how much we spend on missions as of 2008, about $2.1 million. Our total budget in this church is about 5.5, uh, 5.6 million. So uh, 2.1 of that goes into this missions project through the various things that are itemized there. That's about 33%, a third of our spending goes into missions. We started out back in 1987. Up until that time, we really hadn't, there were people that were trying to do ad hoc things to help the poor, but we were mainly preoccupied with our own rapid growth in the church to such an extent. And, and I think we also naively thought that house churches would spread into poor neighborhoods spontaneously and that we would see a ministry to the poor developed that way. We began to realize in the mid-80s it wasn't going to happen, that birds of a feather stick together, that all of our home churches seem to be developing, uh, you know, from campus northward and east and west, but not moving into the inner city. And we realized we're going to have to, we're going to have to take this in hand and do something intentional, purposeful here. The first thing we did was devote $50,000 for that year to open up an inner city ministry in Columbus. We selected an area to focus on about one square mile in South Linden. The reason for doing this is that when you deal with poverty, there is so much of it and the need is so vast that you can just spend money endlessly and it just disappears into this shoreless ocean of need and you never really know whether anything's happening or not and so by describing a physical limit that we would focus our efforts and it doesn't mean we don't give to anything else but it, it this is where most of our effort goes on the council of john perkins and other black leaders they urged us to partner with an african-american church which we did. We found Rama Christian Fellowship, a righteous, God-fearing church here in town, all African-American church, and uh, they agreed to join us and help. Uh, they went in with us, got us the introductions with people. One of our staffers today, James Brown, the, the one of our leaders of this ministry, was a member at Rama Christian at the time. <clears throat> 